morning. It's a beautiful day out there. I'm thankful that the weather forecasters were wrong. I, you know, they said this, that it was going to start snowing 6 o'clock this morning in a centimeter per hour. So I'm glad we don't have like 5 centimeters out there already. I, I just marvel at the fact that you can have a job where you can be wrong 75% of the time and still get paid. I, I, that just amazes me some days. But anyway, it's, uh, it's good to have you here. Where I, I think you can smell all the good smells wafting through. Somebody said I better be quick about it this morning. Um, it's because this is just almost too much. But you know what? We're, gonna, we're just going to go at the pace of where we're going to go and, and celebrate together and worship together. We're glad you're here this morning. If you're able, would you stand with us as we sing our oh, opening song? And I don't have a PowerPoint person right now. Where's my PowerPoint person? Not here yet. Um, uh, Oh, okay. Well, Christian, until Miriam gets here, I'm sure Miriam will be here shortly, but if you could help out, that would be wonderful until Miriam gets here, please. That's great. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Let me know when we have it up. Number, I think it's number 544. The song, the words are up there. All right. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you despair. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Okay, I don't have that one. I'm coming down here. Just a minute. Fear not, then said the angel, there's nothing you afraid. This day is born a Savior of a pure virgin bride to free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. Hey. 
God, we thank you that there can be joy in this season where we celebrate your greatest gift to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for those this morning who maybe are not, their hearts aren't feeling full of joy. Maybe there's a tinge of sadness, some hurt, an empty place. God, would you bring the comfort to our hearts that we need this morning, and that as we worship together, as we fellowship together, would your spirit make of this a day in which we can know your comfort, know your hope and peace, and experience your joy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please, and uh, we're going to sing our next song, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. again. I gotta, I gotta smarten up and get these. Star was gleaming. I like that one too. Is that the last verse of this one? Yeah, there's, a, there's, no, the one there's none of the one I was singing. Boy. Solos. Here we go. Star was gleaming. Shepherds dreaming. Though the night was dark and chill. Angel story. Major glory. Shepherds saw and hearts were thrilled. All oh, that singing, hear it ringing, earth were winging, praises bringing, Christ the Savior born for you, Christ the Savior born for you. Well, that works. All right. Yeah. Well, this morning we have a special guest. His name is Roy Brandt, and I asked him to come and help us worship and uh, celebrate together. Roy, welcome to Wilton Church, and uh, we look forward to your ministry here. Well, it's... It's great to be here. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be here this morning. Uh, at my age, I'm glad to be any place. <laughs> back, uh, <clears throat> back at the end of September, my wife and, and my family and friends around the neighborhood had a birthday party for me, and uh, they helped me celebrate 85 years, so. <laughs> I enjoy singing. I enjoy singing that songs. Every song has a message to tell, whether it's gospel, whether it's country, or whatever. But I love this, the messages that gospel songs had to sing. Everybody likes to take a holiday. Everybody likes to take a rest. 
Spending time together with the family Sharing lots of love and happiness Come on, ring those bells Light the Christmas tree Jesus is the King He was born for you and me Come on, ring those bells Everybody say Jesus, we remember this year birthday. Celebrations come because of something good. Celebrations we love to recall. Mary had a baby boy in Bethlehem. The greatest celebration of them all. Come on, ring those bells, light the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, He was born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say, Jesus, we remember this your birthday. Come on, help me out, will you? Well, come on, ring those bells, light the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, He was born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say, Jesus, we remember this your birthday. Glad for this this time of season, Christmas, and for what it means. You, you know something. You know something, Pastor. I feel right at home this morning. It's just great to when you gather with other Christians. It doesn't matter if you know them or not. You always feel at home. You feel like you're with family, and that's the way I feel this morning. It, it's just a great feeling. From God's heaven to a manger. From great riches to the poor came the Son of God to seek and save. From the azure halls of heaven to a rough and rugged cross, Jesus came to bear his life for all he gave.
going to hear from Roy a little bit later, one more song that he's going to share with us. It's, uh, he's, he gave me a little clue as to what's going to happen, and you're going to participate, hopefully. You're going to be invited to participate. How's that? All right. Uh, just a few announcements. I, um, I think those are all the announcements I need to make. I'm Kids, we have a number of kids. Where's Melanie? Is Melanie? The, hey, Melanie, you ready? You ready to rock and roll with the kids? All right. I got a song for you that goes to the tune of... Can you just start playing the tune and see if we can recognize... Do we know what tune that is? What's the tune? Dashing through the snow. That's right. All right. Well, this one says dashing to and fro in the town of Bethlehem. Joseph tries to find a room for to stay for them. Let's try it, okay? Let's try this song together. Here we go. Dashing to and fro in the town of Bethlehem, Joseph tries to find a room for stay for them. No place can they go but a stable one a sight. Not so nice to have Right. Let's just have a quick word of prayer for these kids as they uh, head downstairs, either four and up to Children's Church or under four, they can go to nursery with Melissa. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time of year that we can celebrate together. We thank you for these children. We pray your blessing on them and their leaders and help us to be able to, together as a, a family, just keep remembering how awesome you are in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you want to follow Melanie out or Melissa, depending, if you're three and under, there's nursery downstairs, four and up, children's church. All right. And I believe it's Roy, isn't it, again? Hi. All right. That kind of emptied out church, didn't it? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. I forgot one announcement, and uh, thank you, uh, Angela, for mentioning it to me. Um, Scott, Isaac. Okay. Isaac Wood, the young fellow who is preparing to uh, go on a mission trip in January, I think. 28th of, uh, December. 28th of December, so it's coming up soon. If you want some information from Angela, you get that information. Isaac would be Stacy Wood's son, right? And Stacy was pastor here in Sealy's Bay, right? I was going to say Selby. No, that wasn't it. Sealy's Bay. And some of you know this family and the connection there. And so if you'd like to know more information on how to... Uh, we either pray for him or have the opportunity to, uh, to give to his ministry, then uh, talk to Angela and she'll fill you in. That's great. Roy, would you come once more and help us to be able to uh, 
Remember why we're celebrating this day. <laughs> My Kathy wanted to be with us today. She wanted to come with me. <laughs> but she was, there was other things. Well, tonight at 5 o'clock, our, our church is putting on a, a community banquet at Desronto, and we rent the, the hall at, at the arena. And she, they've, they've set for uh, about 200 people to come expecting and and this is the first time after COVID shut us down as COVID shut a lot of things down but before COVID started we do this every year it's a busy time exciting time and my Kathy looks after that she heads that up with, with the help of a lot of other folks too I'd like to play something on my mouth organ for you I'm gonna I want to play Silent Night and I'd like you to hum along with me would you we'll play two verses this is not in Mohawk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Whew. Roy, we appreciate you allowing us to be blessed in what God has given you, the talents and gifts he's given you. Well, two little girls were talking about Christmas. And one said, my whole life, we've always had a real tree for Christmas, but this year, Mommy and Daddy got an artificial one. And the other asked, doesn't that bother you? And the first replied, no, not as long as the presents are real. <laughs> real presents. What an idea. The Magi were the first to give gifts in honor of Jesus' birthday, weren't they? As Matthew records it, when they arrived at the house in which Mary and Joseph and Jesus were living in, they bowed down at Jesus' feet in adoration. Their worship led to tangible expressions of their devotion. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. They didn't give a, out of a sense of obligation, but rather out of hearts filled with the desire to express honor. And the gifts they gave were symbolic as much as they were costly and even practical. Can you imagine the gifts of gold? I mean, yeah, we know the value of gold today. Well, it had much value back then too. And Joseph and Mary could certainly use that kind of practical gift as they had to rush out of Bethlehem and head to Egypt and hide for a while. Those gifts symbolized faith too. They symbolized love. 
Even though the wise men were the first to give what might be called Christmas presents, they weren't the first to give gifts. Wherever there is genuine love, there are real gifts. For God so loved the world that he gave, yeah, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is at the heart of the gospel, the good news. God gave his Son out of love for you and for me. So how do we imitate our Father? You see, kids are supposed to act like their dad. Well, I'm... At least in the positive things, right? That's what we'd like for them to do on the positive side. And, and, and the wonderful thing is our Heavenly Father has no negative stuff in his life, no negative things, so we're encouraged to be like him. This Advent season, we're looking at seasoning the season based on what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, where he says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. As though seasoned with salt. When I say that, I can remember my mom used to try and keep the salt shaker on the other side of the table from my dad, because dad just loved to pour the salt to anything. And it, I think I sometimes... Mom was a little offended thinking that what she was making wasn't tasty enough or something. I don't know. But dad just loved lots of salt over everything. And, and that's, that's the intent Paul wants for us to have is that our lives should be seasoned as with salt. There's a flavor to them and an and 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 addition to how we live that just makes things better. And we've been looking at seasoning the season. Last week, we looked at seasoning our gathering. Next week, seasoning our glorifying. And then on Christmas morning, season, seasoning our getting. Um, that'll be an interesting one. I'm going to be asking you what you got for Christmas, by the way. So be ready to, to, to tell me uh, about that. I want to know. Um, I want us to look at seasoning our giving uh, this, uh, this morning. Because elsewhere, Paul wrote this. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, what is Paul talking about there? Well, Paul is talking about the fact that um, Jesus laid down his life for us based on our need to be forgiven of our sin. You see, sin is serious business. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And in the Old Testament, in the animal sacrifices that they used to make of either a, a goat or a, a bull or a lamb or a dove or all these animals, there was also the life of the animal that was sacrificed and the blood that was poured out, which symbolized the life of that animal. But the problem was the blood and the life of an animal couldn't cover human sin. All it could do was kind of like make an allowance that, hey, God's going to be okay as long as there is death and bloodshed for your sin, and it's going to kind of cover it, deal with it, hopefully push it away. But only human life and blood could cover human sin. And so when Jesus came, because he was born without sin, he didn't have to die for his own. And he could give his life, he could shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. The penalty of our sin could be put on him. And then when he died, he had paid the price for that. And now that he's living, he's resurrected, he lives beyond the penalty of death. And so he gave his life for us. And John writes this in 1 John 3, 16. We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for each other. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote so much about giving, because real presence, real giving starts in the heart of God. Paul assumes that Christians in the city of Corinth, which was a Greek city, understood that giving to others is a core value of those who have received so much out of God's love. 
And we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 in a moment. And they deal with giving gifts. And in the passage from 2 Corinthians 9, Paul outlines four principles that we can follow as it relates to our seasoning of the season by giving real gifts. Let me give you a little background first to this passage. The church in Jerusalem is in desperate need of financial help. And persecutions of Christians by the Romans and also Jews has taken its toll. Many of the faithful have fled the city. Many of the original leaders of the church are now in prison or dead. And what once was a thriving fellowship has fallen on hard times. Paul began to write in the church, uh, to the church throughout the empire, and that would be around the Mediterranean Sea, down to Egypt and up and around to, to uh, uh, Italy, where modern-day Italy and beyond even a little bit. And he writes to the churches there, and uh, he asks them for funds on behalf of the Christians in and around Jerusalem. They're poor. They're, they're getting excluded from jobs. They're finding it difficult to just stay alive. And so the congregation in Corinth, this Greek city, initially got caught up in the excitement and the spirit of the original appeal and promised to, to generously participate. Now months, if not a year, goes by, and the enthusiasm that prompted a good start, well, it's as scarce as the coins in the bottom of the clay jar labeled Jerusalem Relief Project. And so Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 5, I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead of you and arrange beforehand. So he's talking about other guys he's sending to Corinth. And your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. So he's saying, listen, I kind of, the words leaked out. You guys, you are ready to go and oh, you wanted to help Jerusalem but you've kind of, yeah, the excitement's kind of worn off, and yeah, okay, uh, Jerusalem, we'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there. And what he's saying is, I'm going to send these guys ahead so that when I come in a few weeks, you'll have your gift ready, and there'll be lots of cause for rejoicing. I don't want to show up and go, where's the gift, guys? Like, what's happened? Come on. He, he doesn't want to, you know, sort of make them, force them to give. And he says this, each one, verse 7, must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever." Let me keep reading. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He's talking about giving, how we give and what happens. You will be enriched, verse 11, in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, that's back in Jerusalem, but also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Then he says this in verse 15, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Hmm. How can we season our giving with God's grace this season? Well, principle number one, be generous in your giving. Now, Paul calls on the Christians in Corinth to rekindle their spirit of generosity. And in verse six, he quotes an old Jewish proverb. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You see, Paul is telling us that there is an agricultural law and a spiritual law. Agricultural law, farmer says, well, I'm not going to put that many seeds in the ground because it probably won't be a good year this year anyway. Oh, well, so he'll sprinkle a few here and sprinkle a few there. He's not going to get much of a return, is he? And that's the same principle Paul is trying to help us understand 
about giving. Be generous in your giving. There is a return. As far as Paul is concerned, when Christians have the opportunity to express love through the act of giving, they are to be generous. You see, the way we give is a reflection of the one whose name we carry. Christ generously gave to individuals like you and I, for those of us who are Christ ones are called to do the same. And the law of sowing and reaping will hold true for us spiritually as it does agriculturally. We will get back more than we give out. Now, let me say right, right up front here, that's not why you give. Well, I'll give this hundred bucks because you know what? I'll get a thousand. I had one, I had one evangelist. I, it was a letter that came in the mail and said, if I sent the seed of a hundred bucks to his ministry, God would bless me and I would reap a thousand. So I got my pen and paper out and I, I wrote on the back of his letter and put it back in the mail and sent it to him. I never heard back from him. I don't know why. Because I said, if you believe in this principle of sowing and reaping, why don't you send me the hundred and God will bless you with the thousand. Come on. I never heard back from him. <sighs> Dear. Anyway. So Paul and the first principle says, be generous in your giving. Principle number two, be joyful in your giving. Hmm. Let me read verse seven again. Each one must do as they have purposed in their heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. One mom decided it was time for her daughter to start putting some of her allowance in the offering plate so she gave her a, a loony and a $5 bill and told her to decide which one to put in when the, the plate came around. She stared. $5 bill, loony. $5 bill, loony. Well, as the plate came around, she chucked the loony in and pocketed the $5. Mom passed the plate down the rest of the pew and then after a moment said, Honey, why did you choose not to throw in the $5 bill? Well, mom, you always tell us that God loves a cheerful giver, and I can give that loony a whole lot more cheerfully than I'd give him five bucks. Oh, how true. The Greek word translated cheerful, God loves a cheerful giver. Listen to this. The Greek word is hilaros. It sounds like our word for hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. Isn't that cool? I think that's so neat. I think that's so. God loves a hilarious giver. There is genuine joy in giving when you're not held hostage by others' expectations or demands, but are free to act on the desire you have to extend kindness to another. Principle number three, God will take care of you when you give. Look at verse eight with me, if you would. I know I'm moving quickly here, but in God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. An abundance. God is able to make all grace abound to you. That word abound means to be in excess, to have enough and to spare. I always say that God's shovel is a whole lot bigger than my shovel. Honestly, it is. I found it to be true over the years. Simply put, God sees when you give and will not see you go without so that you can keep on giving. I remember back in the 80s, early 80s, Joe and Sherry Schaefer had a little baby and Joe was attending Bible college in Toronto full time. It was time for the offering to be taken up at church during the worship service. And Joe put their last $5 in the offering plate. Sherry kind of, she said she raised her eyebrows at that. And Joe said, don't worry. After church, getting into their car to leave, they found a $20 bill taped to their steering wheel. It just, and Joe and Sherry said, every time they turned around, that was happening. And I'm not talking about you giving money to this church today, okay? I understand that. Some of you are sitting there going all nervous on me. Hey, I'm not talking about giving money to this church, all right? I'm talking about seasoning your season in the lives of other people around you. But what I am saying is that when you give with the right motive, God sees it and he will provide for you. He'll take care of you when you give. 
That's what I wanted to say. It's not my notes. I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? We're going to make good time here. Okay, good. All right. I need this thing. I'm afraid that's going to go flying if I don't move that. I, I got to tell you what, folks. There are times. I don't know this for sure. Uh, sure, I don't have empirical evidence on this, but I am convinced, and I believe Diane, my wife, is too, that there are times in which when we gave, God kept stuff from breaking down or bills coming in unexpectedly. I believe that firmly. I honestly believe that. That God kept stuff running when otherwise we might have had bills. Let me, I wasn't, yeah. I, I was, no, I wasn't going to share this because it looks really bad on me. Okay? It does. It really looks bad. I had one time somebody gave me $100 and said, it's for the church or somebody who has a need? I came home thinking... I have a need. I did. I got greedy. I kept it. The next afternoon, we got water all over the laundry room floor. The washing machine's leaking like crazy. Call a guy. He comes. Looks at it. Yeah. Yeah, you need a new this and a new that. And I, how much is that going to cost? Oh, about a hundred bucks. <sighs> Lesson learned. Hey, okay. here's your sign. Um, <laughs> so what do I do? Because now I feel like I just got a big spanking from God. I did. I really felt like I got a big spanking from God. So I go to the person that God originally kind of put in my brain that the 100 bucks was supposed to go to, give it to them. They're right on the verge because of circumstances in their life financially. And so I pull out the wash machine to make, see, okay, now what do I need to do? And it turns out the two hoses that were connected for the drain, so whoever had first put them together didn't do it very well. All it took was a, about a 25 cent clamp and a bunch of tape and the thing was fixed. No more leaking. I'll tell you what, God taught me a lesson that day about giving and about holding on to stuff when I shouldn't have and about making sure that I stay where I'm in, in between the lines where I'm supposed to. Oh, thanks, Lord. I didn't really want to share that story, but anyway, you got it now. Um, so be generous in your giving. Be joyful in your giving. God will take care of you when you give. Principle number four, gifts given in the name and love of Christ keep on giving. In verse 12 of the passage we just read, it says, the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, that's the people back in Jerusalem, but also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. There's, there's just this continual giving of thanks to God because of what you guys did for them. That's, that's, the gift just keeps on giving. That's cool. I like that idea. Jesus also tells us that we shouldn't store up for ourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But, he said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You see, you can send your wealth on ahead, but it's not material wealth. But it's the wealth of who you are in Jesus and how you stay between the lines and live out life in love for him. Oh, so the question this morning is this, is your giving real or just gift swapping? Well, somebody's giving me a present, so I better get them one. That's just gift swapping. That's all it is. Do you end up giving gifts because you would be embarrassed if you sat this Christmas out? Where's the joy in that? Paul tells us that the Macedonian Christians had a way of giving with joy, even out of the very little they had. Macedonia was north of Corinth, north of Greece, and uh, it was an area of not very wealthy. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to read a number of verses here. Now, brethren, he says, we wish to make known to you, so he's talking to the church Christians in Corinth, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the churches in Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. 
For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. You ever heard of a faith goal as far as giving is concerned? I, I, we've done this before, and I've heard lots of people do this. At the beginning of a year, you say, okay, God, I would like to give, let me throw a number of the $500 to missions this year. And you don't have an extra $500 in your budget, but it's a faith promise. And then watch how God starts to insert extra money into your budget from places you never expected. And you can give by the end of the year. You've been able to give that 500, but it's come not out of your regular budget, but somehow money has come into your life. And God says, I want to help you honor that faith promise. Um, try it sometime. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Verse 4. Begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. So Paul is using the example of these really poor Christians to say, guys, come on, come on, let, let's raise the bar a little bit here. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. That is the work of giving. I am not speaking this as a command, but as uh, proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Roy, you sang about this in your second song, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through the, his poverty might become rich. That verse is Christmas. Our Lord Jesus Christ was rich, rich beyond our imagining, because he came from heaven to become poor. Poor? Yes. Reduced to the size of a single cell and then had an animal feeding trough for his first bed. That's why Paul gushes in verse 15 of the next chapter, chapter 9. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You see, God is the greatest gift giver. And we can excel in the grace of giving because we have such a great model. Let me give you a few ideas. The next time you see a Salvation Army kettle... Stop and think about what you were going to put in there and then double it or triple it or more. Here's another one. Have you ever had someone sincerely admire an article you were wearing or an item in your home? Consider it a giving cue. Why not place that special something in a gift bag and give it to your friend? And here's another. If you know of someone who needs help because of their health is slipping or some other reason, make up a coupon that they can redeem for a meal or X number of hours of housework or laundry. And here's one more. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to those in your church or your neighborhood who will be alone this Christmas season. Invite them into your home. Give them the gift of your hospitality. You see, as you can see, we can take our cue from Paul's instructions to the, to the Christians in the uh, city of Corinth. When we do that, we aren't as concerned about what we give as the attitude with which we give and how much of ourselves we give as an expression of God's love. Wayne Mesmer learned that firsthand. For 20 years, Wayne had been the public address announcer and national anthem singer for the sports teams in the city of Chicago. After singing at a Blackhawks hockey game in 1994, Mesmer was shot at close range by two teenage boys. And because the bullet had passed through the singer's throat, the doctors who operated on, it, on him gave him little hope that he would ever talk again, let alone sing. Amazingly, six months later, Mesmer returned to the microphone at the stadium. Physical healing was one thing. Emotional release from the hatred and resentment he felt was quite another. Because of his personal faith in Jesus Christ, Mesmer was convinced that his emotional healing was hinged on his ability to forgive his young assailants. In his book, The Voice of Victory, Mesmer writes this, In spite of my frustration, I believed I had reached a point where I could honestly say I had forgiven these young men. In doing so, over a period of contemplative and reflective prayer and meditation, I was confident that I had set myself free from the chains that had connected me to this incident. Although one of the boys had been released on a plea bargain, the other, James Hampton, remained in prison. Now, to prove to himself that he had truly forgiven his would-be killer, 
Mesmer drove 225 miles to Galesburg Correctional Center and asked to see the young man. Although several years had passed and Hampton had grown from being a teenager to an adult, Mesmer found the grace and strength to speak these words. James, I'm here to see how you are doing. After a two-hour emotional visit, Mesmer turned to leave. and Reaching out and touching Hampton's forearm, he offered a benediction that betrayed the freedom he felt in his heart. James, I bid you peace. Because Wayne Mesmer received from God the gift of spiritual and emotional freedom and the grace to have been forgiven of all his sins, he was able to give the gift of forgiveness to one who hadn't admitted his guilt or even sought reconciliation. Talk about a real present that conveys the presence of Christ. That's also a wonderful example of the kinds of real gifts you might consider giving this year. They don't have to be gifts that are found in stores or online. Maybe they will be gifts that can only be purchased with the currency of love and forgiveness and offered with letters, phone calls, or hugs. How will you season your season? How will you give with the generosity of Christ this Christmas? Maybe it will be fewer material presents and more presence of yourself in the presence of Christ and His grace through you. In the book, Unplug the Christmas Machine, the authors wrote the following pledge. They called it the Christmas Pledge. Believing in the true spirit of Christmas, I commit myself to remember those who truly need my gifts, express my love in more direct ways, examine my holiday activities in light of my deepest values, and rededicate myself to spiritual growth. So whether you have a real tree or an artificial one, be purposeful in honoring Christ by giving real presence this Christmas. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you can remind us in so many different ways what it means to be real. Oh, we've had enough of artificial people in our lives. People who wear masks, who hide their feelings, hide their real self. And then don't even give real gifts. Oh, God, forgive us when we've chosen to do that. Help us, help us to take off the masks. To stop hiding behind stuff or others or lies even. Help us to get real and to give real. Oh, we need your help and strength, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would like to have a copy of that Christmas pledge, I've photocopied. Let me just show you here. I know it went through fairly fast. I've got a bunch of cards here with that Christmas pledge written out. If you'd like to take one, it's there for you. And uh, you can maybe think about adopting it or some of it or all of it for yourself. Let's stand together as we sing our closing song remembering that God gave us an amazing gift. Once in royal David's city stood a lowly cattle shed where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his dead. Mary was that mother Yeah.
Giving really boils down to, I was going to say two things, but it's three things. Love God, love each other, and then go out there and be the church. But before you...